is Anka Metcalf. I'm the CEO and founder of TradeOutloud.com. I do have a presentation uh, for you guys, starting with 4 p.m. Eastern. We're going to be talking about commodities, a uh, little bit about um, seasonality in commodities, but also the technical patterns. I am mostly a technical trader. So when I say mostly, I mean about 95% technical. And of course, I pay attention to seasonality. And uh, seasonality is something that is very serious, whether you're trading stocks or futures. And I hear a lot of traders saying that, hey, you know what? I really like Amazon. I think Amazon is going to go into a Santa rally and I think Amazon is going to go higher. But the reality is that I posted a couple of weeks ago the fact and I posted on uh, Twitter uh, on our Twitter feed, which is the handle is trade out loud. And I did mention that the seasonality for December for uh, Amazon. Amazon is going to go lower. So it's uh, lower to, towards sideways. It's not going to have much, much price action. So uh, you can see oftentimes that some season, seasonality also uh, plays really well with the technical pattern, because if you look at the technical pattern of Amazon, I could just put it right here. Uh, you can see basically that it's not trading into any kind of directional, uh, directional pattern. So if you're getting a, you know, a little bit, uh, I would say zoom out and look at a little bit higher time frames, you would see that definitely, yeah, you know, the uh, uh, Amazon stock is into an uptrend. However, it's not reaching any kind of decision because you could easily see that from the month of December and even before the month of December, it was really trying to reach a decision and it has not reached that decision yet. So seasonality plays a very important role in technical analysis and oftentimes technical analysis points out to the fact that, hey, you have to wait for the seasonals to kick in. Now, as we're approaching the end of the year, going into January, these, these can become and we can actually observe a Santa Claus rally or a potential window dressing effect as we're going into the year end. And then we can potentially see some January effect. Now, if you guys don't know what this is, I can explain it like very quickly. So when you're talking about January effect, uh, when you're talking, let's start with the beginning, when you're talking about a Santa rally. So Santa rally is an event that is happening in the market quite often, almost every year. Sometimes it's coming a little bit earlier. Sometimes it's coming a little bit later, sometimes before Christmas and sometimes a few days after uh, Christmas. And it is uh, a natural progression in price action to the upside, especially in stocks that have been outperforming the whole entire year and especially the last quarter. So the price is just getting uh, higher because institutional traders just jump into, uh, jump, jump into these trades as part of an early window dressing. And some of, some of the Wall Street uh, suits, let's say, uh, as they receive their Christmas bonuses, they reinvest them in stocks. So that is, you know, simply put the Santa Claus rally. I want to show you a really quick example of the Santa, uh, Santa Claus rally that we had a couple of years ago, and that was very significant. I'm actually going to go into a higher time frame right here. So in 2018, uh, this is a monthly chart. So this is 2018. And if you guys recall, if you were trading the markets back then, you could very easily see that we have a mass, we had a massive volatility that came in October and in December. Now, everybody knows that October is actually the most volatile month of the year and uh, shakeouts are possible. In fact, the year has started with January with the actually February and March volatility. And this came after a massive trend that broke into elections. So you can see here that we had the election breakout in November. This was the breakout point. And we had a pretty substantial rise into the market, into the SPX uh, into January, 2018. And that is when the volatility has started. The price was getting extremely extended from any kind of support level and it was trading into extensions. We did have extensions and actually really wide extensions to the upside. And if we have time today, I'm actually going to show you what we can expect for the 2021 market. Uh, and uh, soon after hitting a new high in October, you could see it in September in October right here, the volatility has started. And this is something very typical and it's also part of the seasonality. So this is very interesting. Now the S&P stocks going into, that are going into the um, that are going into the year end, into the Santa rally, into the window dressing event. I'm going to circle back on the window dressing event and explain to you exactly what that is. 
uh, you're not going to see a huge impact. Usually the stocks that are rising into the, uh, and also commodities, but also stocks that are rising into uh, a potential Santa Claus rally or a window dressing are mostly uh, stocks that are um, uh, NASDAQ stocks and uh, mostly Russell stocks. So small caps usually outperform into the, uh, into the end of the year. And today it was no surprise that Russell has gained more strength and Russell was able to punch in new highs. And we had uh, quite a substantial divergence in the market today in NASDAQ, the Qs, right? So if you're trading the market and if you uh, look at you know, how it behaved, it was very erratic. And this is very typical as we're going into the holiday season and as we're going into Christmas. In fact, today I said goodbye to my members in the trading room and the next time I'm gonna see them is going to be January 4th because I don't trade this low volume. I need a lot of market participation. So going back and circling back to uh, the uh, SPX here, the seasonality and also uh, looking at uh, looking at the chart pattern. So when it comes to seasonality, the SPX is always going to be picked up. And usually in, uh, when you're dealing with this phenomenal effect, which is the window dressing effect, uh, what this basically is, is that hedge funds, portfolio managers love to dress up their portfolio for their clients and love to ditch the losers, you know, like American Airlines and whatever was very weak this year, let's say restaurants, whatever it is, the travel industry was especially affected by COVID and that had a substantial drop. So when you're looking at the market, they want to ditch all of those non-performing stocks that they were in and they want to dress up their portfolio just to show their clients at the end of the year, uh, you know, some stocks that were, that had really great performances like Apple or uh, let's say a stock like Microsoft or you know, stocks that like Twitter, for example. Okay, so stocks that have been outperforming, especially into the last quarter. So the end of the year has that special vibe because it's a lot more powerful than any kind of window dressing. And by the way, window dressing happens every single quarter at the end of the quarter, but it's much more, uh, it has much more potency as it's going into the year end because you have the year end, uh, year -end phenomenon as well. Uh, the, uh, the January effect is actually the opposite of window dressing. So what happens, uh, instead of institutions just, you know, the, the, remember those institutions that jumped into those high flying stocks, uh, that were lining up just around this time. Now in January, the stocks that they have dumped because they didn't want to hold them in the portfolio and especially for tax purposes to write off their losses. Uh, when the when January arrives, they are picking up back their back the stocks that uh, they have uh, like th that they have ditched uh, into the end of December. So they're gonna leg back in. So it's never a good idea to jump into stocks that are making new lows or to pick bottoms, especially in the last two weeks of the of the of the year. Uh, it is a good idea, though, to look at the technicals and, of course, the seasonality of the stocks that were dumped into the end of the year and do an evaluation at the beginning of the year because you would buy them at a discount, obviously. Uh, so going back and now circling back to the m and S&P, m and S&P is not, I'm sorry, uh, uh, S&P 500 and, of course, the m and S&P, if you're trading futures, is not really subject to... Um, seasonality that much into the end of the year because stocks that are within the S&P and funds that do, do own S&P stocks, they're not selling them and they're not just jumping in. So those are rare opportunities that are happening mostly in tech stocks and also small cap stocks. All right. And in some, uh, in some Dow stocks as well. All right. So talking about projections. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about projection before we jump into some commodities and I can show you some projections that we uh, are looking for 2021. In fact, it is lining up to be a phenomenal year for the commodity market. The commodity market is finally waking up and I'm going to talk about that in my presentation at four o'clock. Uh, and talking about long-term projections, uh, I want to show you something that is very interesting here. I'm going to give this chart a little bit more time so you can understand uh, more of what's happening uh, into the market in general. And with any instrument that you're trading, and especially if you're doing options, if you uh, want to determine you know, the timing or if you want to determine the next uh, target area, this can be easily determined by 
uh, easily determined by some really quick measurements. So can everybody here in the room remember the 2008? How many of you, of you guys in here were trading the 2008 uh, price action? How many of you guys in here were, is anyone in here in the room that was trading in 2008 or are you guys just really new traders to the market? Anyone in here? Nope. Okay. Michael, heavily. Okay. You and me both. And we have learned a lot. We have learned a lot from, uh, from that period. Okay. So here is what I'm seeing. So can anybody also tell me what is the directional bias? Okay. Hedge fund trader. Awesome. Can anybody tell me what is the directional bias right now uh, in the S&P 500? Well, it makes higher highs, it has higher lows, and it has a really long directional bias, right? Because it's continuing to, to outperform, right? And you can see here, there are a lot of indications uh, on this chart that we're really punching through higher. And there's no doubt that this is, uh, this is definitely a, a long-term uh, long term for hire. Okay. So what I, what I looked at, so I started trading obviously, you know, uh, before the year 2000, I was on the institutional side and, um, I was definitely a very long term trader. I was not a small time trader, a day trader or a swing trader for that matter. So I would live through cycles. Um, the fact of the matter is that I would, uh, let's say I would pay attention to earnings, but earnings would not affect anything that, uh, anything that was going on into the market. So as scary as it was back in 2008, 2008 was just a revisit of the prior high from the dot-com bubble right here in the year 2000. So you can see that this is a double top formation or more or less this is a double bottom formation that we had here. And soon after we had the rotation that punched higher. This aggressive move for the upside that took out the high and actually had a really nice gradual. So you can see it here. So we had an A, B, C, and D correction. And from this point on, the, uh, the second time around from, the, uh, from this a support spot into the 200 simple moving average. By the way, this is a 200 simple moving average right here. We have the price that not only uh, not only punched in through the first area of resistance, but also punched through the uh, major area of resistance that we had overhead created by this double top formation. And these are the QE years. So if you guys remember the QE years, the Fed was literally printing money and we were just uh, continuing higher. So I just wanted to show you this. I'm gonna zoom it in a little bit so you guys can see some kind of price action here. That makes more sense. So when we look at this projection right here, we can see that it started off, it pulled back, it started off again, it pulled back again, and this is the release to the upside. And once it got extended a little bit, you guys know that we have, uh, we had the 2015 with the beginning of 2016, you guys know what happened. We had the falling of the oil prices, uh, we had the Brexit issues, we had Italy and we had Greece that was defaulting. So this is the whole volatility. But other than that, we didn't have any other volatility. Okay, so from this point on, this was the breakout phase uh, into the 2016 election. This is actually the 2016 election, uh, the election uh, breakout, and we continued for higher. But it, there's something other, uh, other than that that I want to show you. And having confidence in technicals, and that's the reason, the number one reason why I rely on technicals 99% of the time. Because when I'm taking out and I'm performing an extension to find out the projected target that is set not only for, and this is again, long-term, these are monthly charts. So I'm looking for a monthly projection for higher. You can see the way you have traded, it have traded, right? So when the market was doing this formation right here, I'm gonna zoom it in a little bit. So this is a prior low that we had. And this was, uh, like I said, this was in 2002 low. We have also a little, very small double bottom right here. If you look at your daily charts, you can see it right here. We had this higher low and we had obviously a divergence here that uh, that confirmed that the move is ready to continue higher. The same, uh, the same aspect we had on the monthly chart. So you can see I'm using a very simple indicator is a William percent R. And it was trading into, uh, it was trading below 80 and had actually an extreme low right here that would coincided with the, uh, with the same kind of lows that we had into these, uh, into these uh, 2000, end of 2002 markets.
So everything lined up. So this was the time to reload, and especially here. So I was I, I was one of uh, I was one of the traders that initiated a little long here, right into these areas, and you can see that these pullbacks. And I didn't lose any money because uh, I was very aggressive and was going for very small targets because I knew these were short squeezes and most of the stocks that I was trading. And then once we had another leg down, this was another correction that we had. I would engage long here. And again, so throughout this whole entire 2001 and 2002 period, I was getting like short squeezes, short squeezes. And then all of a sudden when I saw that there was a massive consolidation at, at least uh, three pivots to the downside, so I need a repetition of two plus one, the price rotated and it started to continue high right here. And here, in fact, this was the time of reload and this was a monthly rotation. And this was the first time around when we had a, a higher low compared to the prior low. And this was the rotation that actually, uh, you know, took the price higher. Uh, base, I love bases, I love ranges, I love breakouts, I love breakdowns, depending on uh, the trend of the asset that I'm trading. Continuation higher, 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 okay? So this is the dot com, the, the, this was the dot com era, and also this is the post dot com buy opportunity. Now this is the financial, right? This financial crisis took the price lower. In fact, you can see here that we haven't had any rotations. This was the first rotation that happened here. So typically, if the market would have strengthened, this was the area where it should have continued higher, but then it pulled back and the next rotation came all the way in April 2009, where I was buying with both hands right here. So this was a great buying opportunity. What did the other traders do? And including, you know, some of uh, the individuals that I personally know, they were exiting the market. So not only that, you know, a lot of companies were going under. If you guys remember back in 2008, we have Circuit City that went bankrupt. How many of you guys remember Circuit City? We had linen and things that went bankrupt. We had all the stores that were going bankrupt, bankrupt left and right. We had the financial crisis, banks were going down. They received money, right? They received the bailouts. Um, if you guys remember GM went under and it received financing from the government. Remember the jokes with the government uh, motors, okay, GM. Uh, and then again here, when we had the double and we had the rotation right here, uh, I, I, I was actually looking since we, uh, since we were trading in the, to the 760 zone here in the SPX, I was looking for a buy opportunity. And I was waiting for this, uh, for this rotation, not for long term, because nobody knows in advance what's going to happen, right? But I was buying with both hands and I was buying stocks that were very cheap. One of the stocks that I bought uh, back then, and it was, uh, I think it was around, 20 cents or so, it was Sirius Satellite. If you look at the stock today, and this is for investment purposes, uh, if you look at it today, it's over six or seven bucks. So that was a huge opportunity right there. And I was looking for companies that had uh, no competition and that really didn't stand a chance to go off the market. So that was a really great opportunity to buy with both hands. The fact of the matter is that this pullback that was created here, and then we're going to come to the pullback of COVID, what happened here, a lot of individuals were shorting. Uh, and not only that, that we had algorithms that were rolling out into the short, rolling, I'm sorry, rolling in into the shorts. And not only that, but we had a lot of individuals that were seeing the price go down. They had their 401, 401ks or whatever kind of, uh, you know, or retail accounts, if there were any, uh, in any trade. And because of the fear, and the lack of knowledge. I mean, now investors are much more knowledgeable than they were in 2008, because now, you know, you turn around and you see probably five or six uh, trading companies, uh, you perform a Google search and you're going to have thousands and hundreds of thousands of training education companies and also a lot of free materials and free education and uh, you can become financially literate. But back then in 2008, Remember, there are not even a lot of trading rooms, the webinar like this, these were not around. So nobody, I don't know of one webinar that would be online. So we'd have, you would have to travel if you would have wanted uh, to, uh, if you would have wanted to take, uh, to take a course or to take a free presentation, you would have to, uh, you would have to travel uh, to a hotel or a, a banquet center to receive that education. And I did a lot of those that was in uh, Detroit, Michigan back then. And Detroit, Michigan, like one in every three to four houses that were in my neighborhood were, were in foreclosure because GM went under, we had a Ford that went under, we had a Chrysler and the situation was pretty bleak 
uh, around there. So uh, I took a lot of pride of helping a lot of my friends and a lot of my acquaintances, you know, try to hold on to their portfolios. And I said, now, this is not the time to sell. But there were a lot of individuals that kept on adding to, the, uh, to, uh, to this fear because they were pulling money out of the market. And what do you think this happened? This, uh, this created this flurry to the downside. Now, uh, remember what I said that we were looking at this consolidation below the 80 right here. This is another consolidation with an extreme low read right here for a buy. And this was the actual buy opportunity uh, for the upside right here. So now, like I said, this is the high of the uh, major resistance spot and this is the low of the major support spot. So connecting the two dots and ju just doing some simple projections, you can see that the price uh, went higher into the next resistance spot. Now take a look at the price action formation into this area. We had the 10 EMA that was literally following the price. It just created that really nice trend for price action. And remember, these are the QE years. And we had a really nice tight consolidation. This is actually a sandwich formation where we have two uh, bull candles just sandwiching a, a bear candle right here and squeezing the bears out of the equation. And what do you think the next target is? And remember, these levels that I have here, they were determined uh, uh, based upon these prior to highs and these prior to lows right here. Okay, so you can see that back in 2015, uh, and by the way, this 2015 to 2016 was really tough to trade. A lot of garbage, not a lot of growth. It was just crazy to trade around this time. I remember day trading and swing trading was very tough because you could see that the price was definitely range bound. But when the price started to pop up and this actually came right into election, so it uh, created a little pop before in July. So July, August, September, October, it was a sideways range again. And then finally election came. And guess what the next target is? This 261.8% line. Okay. And see what the price did. It went up. There were some gyrations here because the price went almost parabolic up. It pulled back to the 10 EMA, 100% full technical. It, uh, it, the price popped back again. Create and by the way, it just respected the, the trend again. So this high traded above the prior high, and then again, this big volatility came in. Now I'm not going to go into detail, but this volatility was created by some algos that were introduced into the market, into the London, uh, into um, uh, into the uh, London session, um, and also into the new New York session, and those were ado uh, adopted. Uh, into September. So at the end of September, September 30th, I think they came into the market and this is what they happened to uh, back then. So this is all algorithmic pullback right here. Uh, but then again, though, very technical, as you can see here, the pullback came right into this 50 SMA long-term rotation point for here for a continuation higher. Now, can anybody tell me based on the projection back from 2000 to 2008 from that really massive major resistance and major support spot. Can anybody tell me if we have room for the upside? Of course we do. And this is the next projection. How interesting it is that we made a high, we came and pulled back right here into the 2180, uh, 20, uh, 2180 spot, rotated. So you can see the correction that came very close into this uh, 161.8 rotation back up. Do we have still room for higher? You bet. 423, this is the projection for long-term trading. So if you look at the S&P and say, hey, I'm a long-term trader. I want to invest in the S&P. This is the next projection spot. It's not going to go directly there parabolic because you can see that these extensions are a little bit wider. So it's very easy to achieve these small projections, but these are larger projections. And these are projections from the year 2000. Now I want to show you something that is a little bit uh, interesting. So keep in mind 4,500 uh, and that is the next long-term projections for it. I want to clear this up and I want to take you a little bit to the weekly chart. And I want to show you that based on another major correction that we had, and this is the COVID, uh, COVID correction. Remember the fear that we had in the market, everybody was selling, selling, selling. Well, this is accelerating because there are algos at every level and algos are just hitting level from level. And they know that, let's say from the 20 SMA, they were going to rotate and go higher. And if they don't find any buyers at that point, they're going to trigger short right under the 20 SMA. And they created the flurry to the downside. Now, I want to show you the, um, and these are medium-term projections that I'm doing for the market uh, for 2021. 
Okay, so I'm connecting the dots and what I'm seeing here is that we're into massive resistance and that's why the price is kept into this uh, area. If we should get a Santa rally, if we should get any kind of window dressing effect, and by the way, window dressing effect can be seen about four to five days before uh, the end of the year. And if we should have any kind of Santa rally, if we get a pop over this high that was just created, you can see here, this is just a peakable high that we have, a little periscope high, as the traders call it, 37.26.7. If we get a pop and stay and close above this 127.2%, we have a wide tradable void to 4,200. And again, this is, again, a longer term, a medium term projection because the longer term projection, remember that we have it into the 4,500. Okay, because we had it from the monthly charts. So this is uh, something that I really pay attention to. Into the end of the year, I also like to pay attention to, um, and especially at the end of the quarter, I like to pay attention to uh, quarterly charts. Now remember, quarterly charts, um, each candle represents three months of trading activity. So this is something that investors use quite often. Uh, and uh, also, um, I love to look at these technical patterns for continuation. I love to look at the uh, uh, not only technicals, but I like to look at uh, the patterns and formations, whether it's continuation or rejection. So what I do see here is that we had, and these are simple technicals. This is you could go to any online, you know, outlet, and you could read about candlesticks uh, and the uh, what uh, each candlestick, uh, the psychology behind each candlestick, and what they what they mean and what formations mean. But this is something, this is, this is the COVID retrace and you can see it right here. It came into a technical spot, it rotated. And then guess what? The, when into the next quarter, right? Because uh, January, and this is actually January through March, end of March. When this was all over and we closed, okay? And when we closed, remember we open and we close at the bottom with the red candles. And then we came back into, um, April, we picked up in price. So the next quarter was sideways, but notice that the next quarter was trading in between the prior high and the prior low. So bingo, you have an inside candle. So this is going to, uh, this is going to provide you with a plethora of trading opportunities. And this is what I saw in the market. And I was really aggressive in the stock market. I had my best year ever and a trading over over trading over 20 years uh so this was a no-brainer it was bullish above 32 42 and continuation higher and it would have been bearish below uh 24 43 it was very easy very simple technicals that are used and with very simple chart formations and you can see that the price is trading higher now what do you think is going to happen we have less than two weeks into the end of the year and into the end of the year, uh, going into January, if we start projecting higher, we're going to issue continuation and we're going to be on our merry way into those projections that I just showed you guys. All right, David, I think, uh, I think this is a wrap for now. I'm going to talk to you guys more about commodities as we're going uh, at four o'clock.